What is going on everybody and welcome back to my top 10 of the 80s series and now we are at the top 10 of 1982. So just like the previous videos, I'm going to be giving my 10 favorite movies of this year. I will be giving some honorable mentions on this one. My buddy CP from Willis Creed is actually going to be joining me. I've seen his video early and you know what? I like the way that he did his honorable mentions. So yeah, I'm ripping your shit off, asshole. Deal with it. Two things really quick before we get started. As always, this is my own personal top 10. It should not line up with yours, so don't expect it to line up with yours. I don't expect yours to line up with mine. Just put your personal list down in the comment section below and we can discuss them as film fans. That's the difference of opinion that makes all of this awesome, right? And the last thing is that so far in this series, I have been using the US American release dates for these films, which has caused a little bit of disparity, mostly in the Mad Max franchise. And so there's caused some turmoil in the comments section. One reason why I did that was because that made sense to me. I live in the US. What year would I have seen this movie? What year would I have associated with this year in my memories? And the other side was that I actually thought I was going to be avoiding some of the annoying shit in the comments section. All the um actually comments about actually you wouldn't have seen this until 1981. And it's actually done quite the opposite. Everybody just wants to tell me when the actual release date was in Australia or wherever the fuck it premiered. Guys, I don't care. Can we just talk about movies? Does it really matter? What more do you want from me? So with that being said, Porky's was on my list of 1981 because it premiered in a few cities in the US in 1981, eventually was released wide again in 1982, and The Road Warrior was not in my list of 1981 because it premiered in the US in 1982. So will it show up in this list? Coming in at number 10 for me is gonna be Rocky Three. Now I love the Rocky franchise. I enjoy every single one of these movies. Yes, even Rocky Five. And Rocky III for me has always been one of my least favorite of the franchise, but still good enough to make my top 10. This is one where the 80s Stallone persona really started to take over. It also started to do the same exact thing to the Rambo franchise after the first installment. So this is kind of that Stallone superstar era. And so Rocky III and Rocky IV very much are their own little isolated feel of a Rocky film. And so this is very 80s. There's a lot of like slow motion running and you know jumping up in the water and hugging each other. What I love this movie for is the relationship building between Rocky and Apollo Creed. This is the movie where they start to become friends. This is the movie where they start to become partners and Creed is the one who has to kind of get Rocky out of his funk and train him to get back onto the top after Clever Lang knocks his ass the fuck out. With that being said also, Mr. T as Clever Lang, one of the more interesting villains, one of the more memorable villains that we've had in the Rocky franchise. Bust you up. Go for it. So it's a great movie. It's a great Rocky movie. It's just, I think I tend to lean more towards the dramatic Rocky films than I do kind of the flashy ones, with the exception of Rocky IV, which is kind of my favorite. Never mind. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Number nine is going to be Martin Scorsese's The King of Comedy. And a huge shout out to my buddy CP, who's going to be collabing with me on this video. So as I've already said, be sure you check that out. Link in the video description below. He actually hooked me up with a copy of The King of Comedy because I couldn't find it anywhere. Have never seen this, and it was the one movie of the list of films I have not seen from 82 that I really felt like I needed to give a shot. And I really enjoyed it. <laughs> I really dug it. I mean, obviously it made this list. And this movie is essentially telling the tale of this guy who is so pathetically desperate to be in the limelight, so pathetically desperate to have fans, to have fame, that he goes to unbearable lengths to get there. He's like insufferable with the amount of almost stalkerism that he has towards Jerry Lewis's character, who's kind of like the big comedic persona of the film. Uh, the way that he stalks his office, the way that he sits in the waiting room for hours on end, just on the off chance that he gets to see him walk past, and eventually succumbing to a plan to actually kidnap him and hold him at gunpoint to force him to give him a comedic little five minute spot on his talk show. It's a movie that is darkly comedic, but as time has gone on, the fact that I watched it for the first time in 2022 does not dilute the effect of the film whatsoever because the things that it's trying to say are possibly more relevant now than they were even back in 82. Spoiler alert if you haven't seen the film, but it ends with this montage of all these news reports and radio clips and everything after Rupert Pupkin has been abducted after he has gotten his one shot to fame and he's been broadcast to the entire nation and the news comes out that he actually had to kidnap Jerry Lewis's character and it shows that his plan actually worked. He becomes famous, he becomes well-known, he becomes like this martyr 
for the American audience because of what he went through and what he did and all of the crazy shit that he did to get there. And so he's got book deals and movie deals and his own show. And there's always been this debate of is that in his head? Because throughout the film, there is certain spots where he is fantasizing things about his success that are very much in his head. But I actually think the movie is much more effective and interesting if you choose to believe that the ending is reality and how ridiculous all of his fantasies were all throughout the film just makes it all the more powerful when you realize that his fantasy actually came true because the actual general public is so fucking stupid that that could happen. And you look at all the people in 2022 or the years previous that have become famous for doing the dumbest shit possible. Catch me outside, how about that? Yeah. This is reality, people. Robert De Niro is great as playing a character who's very much not a typical Robert De Niro character. Jerry Lewis is great, a guy who's known for comedic roles and he's much more on the dramatic side on this one. So for a kind of lesser known, lesser celebrated Scorsese film, I think it was actually damn good and I recommend you checking it out if you're like me and have not done so thus far. Number eight is gonna be Blade Runner. Now this is a movie that I have always stuck possibly at the top of the list of films that I respect more than I actually enjoy. Blade Runner is one of those movies that is marvelous to look at. And you look at what they were able to do with the world building and the special effects and everything, especially back in 1982. I mean, it rivals some of the effects that we have in movies today with all the advancements of technology that we have had. But it's the story and it's the pacing that has always made this a rough watch. And I kind of go back and forth. There's times when I watch it and I really enjoy it and appreciate it for what it is and I'm along for that slow burn ride. And then there's times where I get a little bit impatient with it and I appreciate aspects of it more than I do the entire experience. I do prefer Blade Runner 2049 overall, but this is still a movie that it has an impact and it's continued to have that impact over time. So as much as it's not a movie that I necessarily pull off my shelves very often, there are times when I pull it off and I really do dig what Ridley Scott was able to pull off with his whole replicant storyline with Roy Beatty and of course Deckard. And so it's a movie that I enjoy but it's a movie that I respect even more. Number seven is gonna be E.T. the Extraterrestrial. Now for some, this is way too low on this list, and for me, it's actually surprising when I kind of started crunching the numbers that this made my top 10, because besides the fact that I've always acknowledged this is a really good movie and a really good crowd-pleasing movie, and I totally understand why it's this whole celebrated classic of Spielberg's filmography, I've never been somebody who's been overly enamored with E.T. You know, when I was a kid, I watched it and I, I liked parts of it, but it was never one that I rewatched all that often. As an adult, every time that I rewatch it, I expect I'm gonna like it more than I actually do. I like it, I enjoy it, it's a good time, it's a good family movie, it's heartwarming, it's got some, some very horrific dark elements to it that uh, are woven in really well that don't take away from the family aspect to it. E.T. is both entirely grotesque and entirely cute in equal amounts. His relationship with Elliot is really great and heartwarming, so it's a classic for a reason. It's just never been one of my favorites, which is why it's seven and not two. Coming in at number six is gonna be Halloween 3 Season of the Witch. I have always been a massive defender of this movie. I will never understand the Halloween fans that denounce this just because their boy with the mask doesn't show up in it. Take that shit out of your head and watch this on its own merits. And I think most of you will enjoy it for what it actually brings, which is a really creepy, creative, fucked up, crazy, campy story that is just bathed in Halloween atmosphere. This is when they were starting to dabble in the idea of taking Halloween in the anthology route now that Michael Myers is dead. It did not work because unfortunately they decided to use the name Halloween. I still maintain if they had just called this season of the witch, this would have been a cult classic. Uh, and, and right away, not 40 years later, where it's starting to get that cult classic appeal to it now. But what it does give you is just a really interesting, unique story that goes in a lot of bonkers, bananas directions that I really enjoy. Great practical effects, an awesome score. Tommy Lee Wallace, one of the more underrated directors of the 80s and the 90s, really. I mean, this guy gave us Fright Night Part Two, highly underrated. He gave us this one, he gave us 1990 It, which has not aged all that well, but has always been a big piece of my horror heart. So yeah, Halloween 3. Always been one of my favorites since I first watched it, will always be one of my favorites. Number five is gonna be Poltergeist. Now this is a movie that I have seen throughout my entire life, but for whatever reason, I never really put it in my list of favorites. And it wasn't until a couple years ago when we did Haunted House and Demon Possession movies for 31 on 31 Unholy Terrors, and we decided to include the Poltergeist franchise, 
that I watched this and went, damn, this movie's good. Why don't I watch it more often? It has that really gross and dark and grotesque kind of vibe to it that Toby Hooper always brought, but it also had that really family fun kind of 80s entertaining vibe that the Amblin Entertainment side of things always brought, which is why you've always had the debate of did Toby Hooper or Steven Spielberg actually direct this film? And I don't really give a shit who did because it feels like both of their styles were melded perfectly into this classic. And what I love about it is that it goes dark, it goes creepy. It's one of those PG horror films that still has a lot of punch to it. And it just tells a good story about this family and about this family trying to stay together and working together to get Caroline back. And, you know, it goes into the paranormal, but it also goes into some of the demonic stuff. You got skeletons coming out of the ground. And so it's just a treat for everybody, whether you're watching this with some horror noobs, whether you're watching it with some younger kids that are just kind of dipping their toes into the horror world, or you're watching this with the horror veteran that watches I Spit on Your Grave every third weekend of the fucking year. This is a movie that appeals to all horror fans, and so I really appreciate it for being one of the few that can appeal to everybody. Number four is gonna be The Road Warrior, Mad Max 2. And you know, it's a tight race between this and Fury Road, but I think more often than not, I tend to say this is my favorite of the Mad Max movies, just because of that classic appeal. Fury Road's fucking amazing, but there's something old school awesome about the Road Warrior. To me, this is like the perfect embodiment of what Mad Max is, is about. You know, you have the great character of Max Rokotansky, who's brought to life by the great Mel Gibson. You have all of these wild concepts visually that are such a huge evolution from the first film with the leather and the spikes and the way that the vehicles look. Like, it takes post-apocalyptic to the nth fucking degree after what we saw in the original Mad Max. Uh, I think the action is filmed great, still ages very well, it tells a really good story about him kind of drifting into this town, helping these people that need gas and then drifting back out, which kind of becomes the running thing with Max after part two is he's just kind of this drifter that finds himself in these crazy situation and becomes the, the unrelenting hero. And so I've always loved this movie for just having that classic action appeal to where it's so practically done that it ages awesomely but at the same time, there's this vintage feel to it to where it's just like, they just don't make movies like that anymore. And if you're all up in arms that I talked about this in 1982 instead of 1981, just walk away and there will be an end to the horror. Now, before we get to my top three, be sure to like and share this video and hit that subscribe button so that you can follow me on this journey through the rest of the 80s. And if these videos continue to succeed more and more, I might even dive into the 90s after this. And we're also gonna take a small little moment to talk about the honorable mentions, the movies that did not quite make my top 10 of 1982. Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan is undoubtedly the best movie of the original Star Trek slate of films, but the way that I grew up, I always watched the Next Generation movies and the Next Generation show with my dad, and I did not watch the original Star Trek movies until way later in life. So while I acknowledge this is a really good classic sci-fi story, I think I just came to it too late. It's never been one of my favorites. Buried alive. Buried alive. Come! Friday the 13th part three. I mean, did you really expect that to make my top 10? I mean, the movie's got some fun elements to it, but really? Conan the Barbarian, while I absolutely love Arnold Schwarzenegger, and that is the one celebrity that if I ever got the chance to meet, I would probably cry like a little bitch. Uh, Conan the Barbarian, never really been one of my favorites of his. I get the appeal of it. I get how different it is from kind of the movies that he grew to be known for in the 80s throughout the rest of that decade. If I'm being honest, as a kid, I always liked Conan the Destroyer more. Don't hurt me. 48 Hours, one of the big first movies that Eddie Murphy was in. And this is one that I didn't necessarily like the first time that I watched it. And as I rewatched it, I really started to appreciate just how crass the movie is. It's one of those comedies like we, we hear every single day now at times, you could not make this today. And that's what I love about it. You know, there's something about comedy that should have always been offensive, should have always pushed the envelope, should have always said the uncomfortable thing. And I think we've gotten so far away from that here over the past three or four years that it's absolutely destroyed comedy. So when I go back and I start to watch movies like this that just did not give a fuck, 
I have a lot more fun with it. So it's not Beverly Hills Cop. It's not coming to America, but it is still one of those Eddie Murphy's 80s classics to me that I think most people that watched it would enjoy. Creep Show. Now, I'm somebody who has never really been big on horror anthologies, and this kind of fits into that. I didn't really get into this too much. I actually kind of suffered through the first half an hour or so, was not getting into it. So maybe I'll review it someday. Maybe I'll finally move on to Creep Show 2, which I hear is maybe a little bit better, but yeah. Not for me. And last but not least, we have The Last American Virgin. Now, in a year with some really bold and unique teen sex comedies, man, this is one that I almost put on the list just because I wanted to discuss it, but I guess I'll just discuss it here. You know, for all of the movies that glamorize the teenage life and, you know, the way that teens fall in love with each other, or just love in general, it was interesting to have a movie like this that just kind of gave you the big middle finger at the end of it. It was like, oh, you believe things are going to work out right? Well, fuck you. Life isn't on your side, bitch. And the movie's fine. The movie's entertaining, but it will always be known for that last two or three minutes that just absolutely punches you right in the balls. I mean, it's one of those things that you watch it when you're younger and you're like, what are you doing? You can't end a movie like that. And then you watch it as an adult and you're like, yeah, sometimes it'd be like that. I did my best, but I guess my best wasn't good enough. Fuck you, bitch. You broke my heart. And speaking of bold teen sex comedies, my number three is going to be Fast Times at Ridgemont High. I have always loved this movie. It's always been one of my favorite teenage sex comedies. And it's one of the few 80s classic comedies that I would say actually has not lost any of its edge. If anything, its edge is kind of marveled at more nowadays with the way that comedies have gone than ever before. I've tried to watch some of the proven classics like Caddyshack, like uh, Animal House, and some others in there that everybody swears is awesome, and I think it's just the comedy has not aged so well, or maybe I saw it too late in life, but this is one that no matter how late in life I watched it, it's still so fucking funny. It's still so fun to watch for all the wildly different characters that are all unique, that are all fleshed out very well, no pun intended. And for how funny it is, I appreciate that this movie is able to slip in some really dark material in here and some really dark elements of real life of teenage life, especially back in the 80s. I mean, basically everything surrounding Jennifer Chase and Lee's character is like, how the hell did this get made? I mean, she more or less experiences statutory rape in the first 15 minutes of the movie, and then by the end of it, she gets impregnated by two pump chump and has to go through the abortion stuff, and it's just like, guys, I'm supposed to be laughing, aren't I? And I think this is actually one of those times to where putting in some reality, putting in some darker elements, some not so fun stuff into the story actually reinforces how funny and how lightning everything else in the film actually is. And so you have just so many iconic characters by so many iconic actors that this to me is one of those comedies that I would say is timeless. Number two is gonna be First Blood, or you can call it Rambo First Blood if you absolutely want to, but it's First Blood to me. This to me is the best of the Rambo films because it's the one that focuses on the drama. It's the one that puts the story first and not the action, not the Sylvester Stallone persona. And they kind of get back to that in the back part of the franchise to a degree, but First Blood to me is the best because it has a lot to say. I mean, it has great action. It has some great movie moments. It has these kick-ass sequences like Rambo taking everybody out in the woods one by one with these little traps and holding the knife up to Brian Dennehy and don't push it. Don't push it, I'll give you a war you won't believe. And the whole siege on the town at the end where he's this one-man army taking on the police force. I mean, if you go at just a face value as an action fan, there is a ton of this movie that is going to appeal to you that is timeless, physical, practical action. But there is so much to be said in the storyline and with the character of John Rambo regarding the Vietnam War, regarding PTSD, regarding the treatment of veterans after they came back from the war, that it's got such more of an enriching experience than any of the other Rambo movies. So while the explosions are bigger, while the muscles are bigger, while the body oil is certainly more prevalent later on in this franchise, the mix of that awesome action with great acting by Sylvester Stallone, possibly one of his best performances, and and also a really good, engaging, and thoughtful storyline with some important things to say. To me, this is just a perfect 80s action movie. I just hope this franchise comes to a little bit more satisfying of a conclusion. Like, I dug Last Blood, but the note that it ends on, I, I need more from this character. But as John Rambo said, Nothing is over! 
Nothing! And of course, my number one is John Carpenter's The Thing. Did you think there was a chance in hell it could have been anything else? Before I even discuss this movie, I need to say, set it in stone and hold myself accountable. This Sunday, two days from now, after you watch this video, my The Thing review will finally drop. I apologize for the delay. I can give all the reasons in the world, but it doesn't matter. Here, two days from now, we're back on track with the John Carpenter review series, and I'm gonna give all of my long gestating thoughts on this absolute horror masterpiece. And with that being said, this is an absolute horror masterpiece. This is not only John Carpenter's best film, this is my favorite horror film of all time. I think it's the best horror film as far as practical effects, as far as the special effects. I think that the way that they utilize paranoia in the story is unprecedented. I think that the ensemble cast of characters that we have here deserves a lot of commendation for the fact that you don't get to find out a ton about all of these individual characters, and yet I have never once watched this movie and felt like I don't get to know them enough. I feel like you get just enough detail to know exactly who these people are to an extent, just enough to give you the paranoia that the movie is intending on giving you, to where you don't know who's human, you don't know who's the thing, you don't know who to be scared of, who to trust, who not to trust, and that is the whole theme of the movie that is just absolutely flawless to me. I mean, you have the main character of Kurt Russell in McCready, who I love Kurt Russell. You have Keith David in Childs, who is an awesome character, and I love Keith David every single time that he shows up in horror, especially with John Carpenter. But even all the other smaller characters, they just, they're, they're utilized really well for the small amount of information that we're given about them. And I could just talk all day about the special effects. Like I've already mentioned it, but this is just something that has never been matched. It's never been topped. This to me is the Bible for practical effects. And every time I watch a horror film that goes to CG, I always think about the thing. I'm like, motherfucker, go watch that. So I'll save the rest of my thoughts for the video on Sunday because I have a lot of them to get out. I have a lot of them that I've said ad nauseum, but I have a lot of them that I need to keep saying because the thing is one of those movies that I just think never loses a single amount of how iconic, how important, how influential, and how masterful it actually is. And it's my number one movie of 1982. Well, that's it for this one, guys. If you enjoyed this, be sure to check out CP's video down below. Tell him Cody sent you. And also, if you want to stay on this channel, right over here, you can check out the playlist of all of the rest of these top 10 1980s videos. And I'm also going to put my playlist of all of my Rambo reviews as well for you to check out. Please like and share this video. Hit that subscribe button so you don't miss the rest of this series. And as always, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean you have to be.